All right, Judy, it's all yours. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, um, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's really, really nice to see some old faces and some new faces on our course this time, Sports Vision, um, presented by Dr. Paul Harris. And today is our first live session. We're going to have three live sessions in total. And then there's also going to be some recordings, which we'll explain to you more towards the end of the lecture today. So I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Harris to start us off. Wow, that was just fast. Thank you, Judy. Um, so first, I want to say thank you to Hadassah Academic College, uh, to um, everybody there at the school. And there's a wonderful team. Uh, who's helped to put these courses on. Uh, and uh, if I start with one name, I'll probably miss uh, uh, miss a bunch. But uh, you all know who you are. Uh, um, Liat, uh, I think the biggest smile. Uh, and Ariel, your uh, compatriot there. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to support uh, education around the world. Uh, and um, I, I can think of no better place to do it through than Hadassah Academic College. So um, uh, I'll thank, thank you, the leaders of the college, for the opportunity to share. Uh, those of you that uh, know and have been with me know that I simply love sharing information uh, and education on what it is we do. Um, Judy, I think at some point, I don't know if you were planning towards the end, to give people a tour of Moodle so that they know how to get uh, to their resources. I'm having a little trouble still logging into Moodle uh, as a as one of the professors. We've had to change the password and do these things. And um, I totally get that um, uh, the world needs to keep itself safe against uh, phishing attacks and all kinds of things. Um, and I'm certain that the uh, support people at the college will uh, uh, let me in, let me in. No, so that uh, uh, I can make some adjustments to the materials on Moodle. If you've not used Moodle, I will simply say it's an absolutely wonderful uh, piece of software that allows us to put up uh, lots of resources for you uh, in a way that we can um, monitor who's seen what and what things uh, they're using. So I don't know when you want to do that, Judy. Um, um, if, we can do that the last five minutes of today. That's wonderful. Uh, since I have a 10 hour day in clinic immediately after, I will sign off and let you do that uh, towards the end. Um, sure. So we have three sessions that are live. Um, I have recorded all the other sections. Uh, you will be able to watch them on your own. Um, and the um, so today is actually a complete bonus session, um, not in the recorded course, but it's something that is totally new that I put together for a presentation in January, uh, and it is so relevant to the topic of sports vision, I, I think you're all going to enjoy it. Um, so uh, the handouts for it are not yet on Moodle. Uh, later today, I will get them to Judy and ask her to post them, uh, and then I'm sure I will be on Moodle in the next uh, few days or so to add additional resources. <clears throat> Another bonus in this course will be I'm going to do a recording of an interview uh, with Dr. Bob Sennett. Um, Bob has... Um, um, is, is an amazing uh, optometrist. He's done a lot of work with uh, sports vision. Um, and uh, I know you'll, you'll look forward to that as well. I'm also going to show you some additional resources since we did the course before. <clears throat> There's a website uh, that uh, the Legacy Group, and that's myself, Rob Lewis, Nancy Torgerson, Bob Sanet and Stel, uh, Stelios Nikolakakis from uh, Toronto uh, that we have put together called reinventingoptometry.com and I'll show you some of those resources which we will be adding to on a pretty continuous basis. 
so um, besides Moodle, you'll have some additional reference uh, materials. The, the two additional live sessions, uh, and Judy, I can look up the dates. Do, do you have them off the top of your head? Yes, I do. I figured you would. Those two additional sessions are Go Judy. They are on the 17th of May and on the 14th of June. And on both of those days, primarily, I will not be just giving you presentation. Uh, what I plan to do is, in the meantime, when you start watching, and I think we'll open up the first six uh, recorded presentations, um, maybe later today or tomorrow, because uh, it is late in Israel, um, and you can begin to watch them. But as you have questions, what I'm going to ask you to do is send those questions directly to me by email. And I will use those questions as the basis for, um, okay, if it's a quick, easy, did you really say da-da-da-da-da-da, I'll answer <laughs> that directly, okay? But if it's a really wonderful, more philosophical question to me, um, <clears throat> I'll probably use that as the basis for the kickoff of the live the next two live sessions. So those live sessions are going to be completely back and forth interactive, okay? So um, uh, important for you to get that you're gonna have lots and lots of opportunities to ask, uh, ask your questions, okay? I'm gonna actually remove the spotlight, whoever put that there, so that I can have my screen in gallery view because I like to see all the faces. Um, maybe we want to let you know, if you want to just see me, you can, uh, I think you all know all the Zoom features now, right? Give me a, uh-huh. If you want to re, uh, good morning, Anna, I see you now, and Susan, and good. I'm not sure everyone here is familiar, so it's okay to. Okay. In your upper right-hand corner, uh, you have a, a, a little thing that says view. Um, if you go up there and you click on that, I currently have the gallery view. So I've got uh, five across and five down. By the way, I have found and discovered there is a way to put up to 49 um, seven by seven uh, on the same screen, not just 25. So if anybody wants to know that, that's more advanced stuff. But I like the gallery view. If you choose speaker view up there, um, what you get is whoever is speaking comes large on the screen, and then there's a little ribbon uh, of faces up top. Um, if you go full screen, um, then the participant window, if you've opened that, and the chat screen uh, goes away. Um, but you can, I have a, a two screen set up here, and I always move my chat screens and things to a separate screen. So um, if you want to hear the, see the speaker large, you click on speaker view. I prefer gallery view. When I share my screen, um, people go, oh, but I can't see you. And <clears throat> once I do a share screen, um, there'll be a little tiny slider thing in the middle of the screens. And if you slide that right or left, you can change the relative size of the slides versus the speaker. Okay? Um, so, um, <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you right now, I prefer questions to come as they come up with you. Don't just hold them for the end. Okay? And... Um, once I go into shared mode, it's a little harder for me to see all the faces. So feel free to just simply um, unmute uh, yourself and talk, and you'll take over for a little bit uh, and ask your questions. So I really love the questions uh, as we're going, because I think it makes more sense that way. Um, so have you figured out the view, how to change that yourself? Give me a nod or a thumbs up. I can see you. Okay, good. All right. Um, let's get into um, uh, the topic of today. And again, as I say, this is a bonus presentation. I checked that the presentation one that I recorded actually starts at slide one and is an introduction to the whole course. 
And I thought, oh, let's just leave that and give them a bonus right to start. Okay, so um, let me give you some background about the bonus. Then I'm going to share my screen, start up a PowerPoint, and uh, uh, we'll have some fun. So, um, and I'll give you a little background about myself. I, I don't want to duplicate what's in the in the front of the recorded thing, but then maybe you can uh, uh, slide through very quickly. Obviously, you can see I've got some white hair. I've been around a while. Uh, um, I'm third generation in my family uh, in the eye care field. My grandfather was an optician. My father an optometrist. And I grew up in the house where they practiced together. So um, uh, I was always around this uh, and loved it. My father was a teacher at one of the optometry schools, actually, before it was an optometry school um, uh, at the Optometric Center of New York, did a ton of research. I was his one of their uh, favorite research subjects uh, and had uh, lots of fun um, walking along the path of discovery of how things work, um, but more from the sit there, we need, we need your eyeball in a thing. Uh, kind of thing. Uh, they let me keep it in my head, so that was good. Um, <clears throat> uh, by the way, is my English, am I going too fast? Or are we okay? Give me a... Okay, all right. Um, if I need to slow down, you let me know, okay? So give me a... And you can put it in chat, you know, slower, slower, okay, whatever. Um, so... Uh, I graduated from optometry school. I went to SUNY, the optometry school in New York, in 1979. Uh, and I practiced with my father for the first two years. And then I decided I'd rather he just be my dad, not my business partner. Uh, so I moved to Baltimore and opened my own uh, private practice. It was a referral-only um secondary type of care practice specializing in vision therapy. And uh, I had that practice for about 30 years. I'm now in my 11th year at Southern College of Optometry in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, uh, loving it, being with students, doing research, uh, and uh, that kind of thing. In terms of sports, I actually probably started my first interaction with athletes as a third year optometry school student. Uh, I went with a group of optometrists from the American Optometric Association to the National Sports Festival um, in the United States in the years between the Olympic competitions in the middle. Um, so if you're a, a summer um, a sport every four years, in the middle shifted every four years. There's a national competition uh, that's nationwide so that our athletes have the opportunity to continue to compete at that high level, uh, but it's, an, it's a nationwide uh, type of thing. So I got to go to one of those, and over a four-day period, we tested over 800 athletes, uh, and I got to work a station with just an absolute master who I learned a lot from at that time, Dr. Arnie Sherman, um, who uh, faculty was faculty when I was there at SUNY. Uh, he worked with the uh, New York Islanders, their uh, uh, hockey team. Uh, I know Vince will know them. Uh, there was a period they won four Stanley Cups in a row, and uh, Arnie uh, was... Uh, heavily involved with uh, vision therapy with um, uh, many members of the team. Uh, he also does a lot of work with basketball and other things. And it was wonderful to work a station with him um, and, and gain his insights into how we could use something as simple as a Brock string to figure out what a player was going to do in terms of being early, being late, how they judge space or misjudged space, and that the basis of some of their mistakes or errors in sport um, was not because they gave the wrong commands to their body, but was because their visual process was not seeing space accurately. And if that was the problem, that they were seeing space inaccurately, 
if we could diagnose those mismatches through either the application of lenses or vision therapy, we could help create a better match between physical reality and their perception of reality, and that should improve them in their sport. And conversely, those where we found a better match between where the physical objects are in space and where their perception says the object is, were better performers. So it wasn't so much that they were faster or stronger or, I mean, it helps to get to a high level of strength, to a high level of flexibility, to a high level of speed, to get the body into as good a shape as possible. But here's a quote from um, the late Dr. Don Getz. The difference between the average athlete and the superstar is the difference in their visual abilities. And that's really what this course is about. So with that, I'm going to, I think we'll slide into the, into the bonus. Any, if you have questions, again, you can raise your hand, unmute. Um, you can also type in chat. I will have that window open. Uh, so if you're like, oh, I'm not sure if my English is good enough. First of all, your English is way better than either my uh, Hebrew or my Arabic or my uh, um, <laughs> or my Greek. <laughs> uh, good morning, Anna, uh, or good afternoon to you, Anna. Uh, so um, uh, please feel free to use the chat. Uh, uh, once I set the screens up, I will have it. So introduction now to this extra little piece I think you'll find very interesting. Um, I went to the International Sports Vision Association, and um, uh, I will once we're once I'm into Moodle, I'll give you resources for ISVA, International Sports Vision Association. It's a wonderful organization, uh, um, and at one of the years I presented and Bob Santa presented, there's this fellow who gave a presentation, and it was it was okay there. Um, He's a PhD uh, from Arizona State University. But what happened was, no, I don't have my screen on yet, Judy. I, it's just me, okay? I'll share soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> those of you who don't know the United States schools, uh, there are certain schools that are known for leadership and vision therapy, and there are some that aren't. So this particular one wasn't, but I saw this man's name and he was giving a presentation specifically about baseball. And um, uh, you may not know, I, I'll just say right now, I, I'm currently the uh, team optometrist for one of the uh, baseball teams in the United States, the uh, Baltimore Orioles. Uh, I, can, I'll, I was going to wear stuff, but I've got to run immediately to clinic and didn't want to do a, a quick Superman change uh, between. So uh, uh, I'll wear some Oriole stuff at our next live session. Um, so I thought, oh, I want to listen to this guy. But it was being given by the Ohio State University. And, and I, I'm sure you've all done these online courses, uh, not this one. And Susan and Carmen, please turn your, your videos on. I find it really helpful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> oh, you're eating. It's okay. It's uh, uh, here. I'll have a. I'll have a sip of coffee. How's that? Of course, you all don't want me on too much coffee, so that's good. Um, so I thought, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to get much out of this. I love working jigsaw puzzles. I set my laptop up so I could work on jigsaw puzzles, and I started listening to this man. And within five minutes, I was completely entranced. I watched the rest of it. I didn't put a single piece in the puzzle. Um, and then I called him up, um, or I sent him a couple of emails uh, that I, I really enjoyed it, that his presentation was fully in alignment with the way I think about sports and sports vision. And, and let me give you a sense of this. There's a bunch of equipment 
that's out there. It's like, well, if you buy this gadget, you can, and you'll fix this with an athlete and fix this with an athlete. And, and I think some people get this idea, the gadgets are what you need. And I, I just, it's like, no, gadgets don't fix things. Um, I, I'll give you a, a quick aside. I was having, we were at a meeting and uh, an optometrist who's was involved with the founding of the International Sports Vision Association, uh, Charles Shidlovsky. And he's a wonderful, wonderful uh, presenter, optometrist, uh, uh, just a good man all around. We were having a high level dialogue about um, go, no go paradigm. And let, let me give you a sense of what I mean. Um, a bunch of people have done things where they put different colored dots on a ball. And it could be tennis. If I serve this to you this way and you detect this dot, you do this with it. If you detect this dot, you do this with it. Okay. Or if I throw a baseball pitch and the ball has this color on it, don't swing. But if it has this color on it, swing. Do, do you all understand what I mean about go, no go? Okay, so there are a lot of go, no go paradigms in testing and training. Uh, the Synaptex station has a bunch of these. There's, there's a bunch of these gadgets. And people, and you go to a meeting and they're showing you these pieces of equipment and you know, you're sort of drooling, yes, I want the technology, I want the technology. And it's like, oh, and it can do this and it can do this. And the discussion we were having at the meeting was, I, I said to Charles, Charles was advocating for go, no go. And I said, Charles, I would never do something like that with a member of the Baltimore Orioles at an elite athlete uh, kind of thing. And we, we got into a nice intellectual dialogue, okay? Um, and then I heard Rob Gray, the presentation I'm going to get into in a little bit. And I felt completely vindicated. And as I go through this, uh, I, I want you to get a sense that the fundamentals of basic vision therapy is exactly what we're going to use to help athletes be the best them they can be. Okay, so um, this is a book report. Oh, so I, I e emailed with Rob, then we actually had a couple of phone conversations and we were like two peas in a pod. I think you can imagine it. Uh, and then he said, oh, I have this new book coming out uh, in November. And I ordered a pre-copy of the book. I got the book. I started reading it and I'm like, oh crap, I have to do a report on this. Because uh, I have to share it with the profession. The book is How We Learn to Move. How We Learn to Move. Uh, the subtitle is A Revelation in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills. Okay, how we learn to move. Well, the primary purpose of the visual process is what? It's the direction of movement. Purposeful movement is visually guided and visually directed, okay? So when he's talking about how we learn to move, what he's talking about is the visual process revealed, okay? And as he went through this, I was just, oh my God, he is laying out the principles of vision therapy so beautifully in a way that I think we've never really talked about. So let me, this will take a few moments. I'm first going to slideshow, not slideshow. Let's do F5. No, he wouldn't take that that way. Slideshow, boom. What are we doing? Use presenter view. 
from the beginning. Find you guys. Now we're gonna do screen share. Oh, I need to move you first. Sorry, so many steps at the transition point. Now, screen share, optimize for video, share sound, screen one, go. Good. Let's smallerize this. Let's move. Let's get all your wonderful pretty faces up here. Participants, list, chat, list. And let's get your faces up. Show video panel. There we go. All right. Are you all seeing my uh, uh, the screen that says how we learn to move? Good. Thank you, Vince. All right. Good, good, good. Sorry, I have like 16 screens to move through now. Here we go. So that's the book. Um, I got an electronic version of it. Um, uh, so it's available on Kindle, so you don't have to pay any shipping. Uh, and um, uh, what's wonderful is he has set up as well a, um, a website that as you go through, there are not a million. There are many, many videos that show exactly what he's talking about, but he also has, if you notice down here, a podcast. You can actually go there and listen to him uh, talk about a number of these things, uh, and I think that's that's absolutely wonderful. All right, I, and just know I do have the chat screen open on my alternate screen so I can see uh, exactly what's going on there. Let's do this. That. There we go. Now I have multiple happy faces, too, that I can see. Good. All right. So um, uh, let's get into it. So he starts right out with talking about the myth of there being one right way to... Um, to do things. You, you, you think if you're a coach, there must be a right way to hit a ball or to score a goal or to do things. And here's famous people talking about that. John Wooden, uh, if you don't know, was a basketball coach at um, uh, UCLA uh, University in the United States, won many, many um, um, uh, uh, national titles. He's a college coach. And he cleverly said, the eight laws of learning are explanation, demonstration, imitation, and then repetition, 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 meaning just do it over and over and over again. Tony Robbins, a, um, um, I don't know what you'd call him, a business uh, um, inspirational speaker, that kind of thing, said repetition is the mother of skill meaning do it again and again and again. Zig Ziglar, similar type of profession. Repetition is the father of action. So we got both the mother and the father there. It must be uh, everything. Um, Daniel Coyle from his book, The Talent Code, says there's no substitute for attentive repetition. I like the fact that he added the word attentive there. But what you're going to see is starting from the very next slide, we're going to tear this down. I think people think you just need to repeat things over and over and over again, and eventually you'll get good at it. You know, if only you would do all your repetitions with your monocular accommodative rock, just do it. It doesn't matter. You don't have to paint. And it's like, that's not how we learn. Um, and, and uh, Vince and Anna, people who've had uh, courses with me before, I think you get that, to me, the difference between visual training versus vision therapy, that's part of what's embodied in that difference, right? Therapy is that one, and one, 
one-to-one -one ratio being involved in giving immediate feedback about things. It's not visual training. Um, do you know what you're supposed to do today? Go off in the corner, do that 50 times. When you're done, come back. I'll give you the next assignment. So I don't do training. What I've always taught is therapy. And I, I hope you get the difference there. Vince, give me a... All right. And Anna, you're not on my screen right now. That's okay. All right. So this goes way back. Nikolai Bernstein uh, and the hammer, okay? Now, what he was doing with this, uh, and I think you can see how far back this goes. The, so here's, here's um, uh, can you, oh, I know, I can use the laser pointer. Laser pointer, good. Do you all see the red dot? Yeah, okay. So <laughs> it's obviously an old-timey picture, uh, but what they did was they put um, uh, either reflective or uh, some things, one on his um, uh, elbow, uh, two on the hands, one on the hammer, to watch what does a novice do in terms of uh, hitting, uh, so I don't know if he's doing uh, leather or chiseling, but he's using this hammer to whack at the end of a um, uh, thing he's holding, okay? And this was an idea of from the side, well, what is the path that a, um, a person who does this, what do they do with the hand as they're whacking this thing? And you can see the pattern that, that the uh, elbow makes. You can see the hand pulls back uh, and then comes in and hits. Um, uh, the hand comes way up and way down in order to make these uh, movements. So the movement of the hammer is back. The movement of the hand uh, is up because the, uh, the wrist uh, makes an action as well. Um, and he studied the movement of this, okay? Uh, and what he found is <laughs> we get this repetition meaning we get to the end point, but the expert actually doesn't do exactly the same thing over and over and over again. They do variations, but the end result, when the hammer hits, it's hitting in exactly the right place. So we repeat an action outcome, but not by repeating the movement that produced it. So think of in sport. Uh, whatever sport you want to think of. And if you want to give me a suggestion of a sport, I, I typically will use um, um, uh, soccer, baseball, tennis. Uh, I've worked with people in many, many different sports. Um, <clears throat> we know that coaches tend to work with uh, a movement. Um, here's the right way to hit a ball. Here's the right way to throw. Um, and what you're going to see here, and, and I think in vision therapy, it's the same way. There's a correct way to do X or Y. Gee, you didn't move your eyes the right way. Um, so we need to teach you the right way to move your eyes. I, I think you get the idea. That's not what this is about. He says, we don't repeat our movements, but they are also not completely random and variable either. They're shaped by the constraints of our environment, including our culture. What does he mean by shaped by the constraints? If you look at this, a wrist can only do certain things. An elbow can only do certain things. Those movement patterns can't be very different um, um, because elbows and wrists only move in certain ways. Okay? So... The key to becoming skillful was not strict repetition. Instead, it was repetition without repetition. Learning to produce the same outcome by using different movements. And you're going to see this theme coming back over and over again. And 
I, again, as I read the book, I was constantly thinking, how does this apply to doing vision therapy? So in the book, he talks about context conditioned variability. Skillful movers in the same disciplines do not all coordinate their movements in the same way. If you look at two people that shoot a basketball or two people that um, um, uh, score uh, in ice hockey or uh, kick a ball, um, they're very different. And I, I think many of you can recognize, oh, just from the back, uh, the movement, that's Ronaldo, or that's uh, this person, or that's this person. Um, uh, I know sometimes you can see them walking down a hall. You can't, and the, they're walking away from you, but you recognize that's how this person walks. And I think that's some of what uh, he's talking about here. He said, there's significant inter-movement variability between performers. Skillful movers do not achieve their goal by moving the same way every time. There is significant intra-movement, within the same movement, variability within performers. Okay, so now we go, uh, Rafael Nadal uh, is um, uh, quite an accomplished tennis player. He said, you might think that after millions and millions of balls I've hit, I'd have the basic shots of tennis show up that reliably hitting a true, smooth, clean shot every time would be a piece of cake but it isn't. Not just because every day you wake up feeling differently, but because every shot is different every single one. No ball arrives the same as another. No shot is identical. So that's a thing to keep in mind. And by the way, when I, when I went to my first uh, spring training with the Orioles, I began to see how many times a day are these guys particularly not the pitchers, but the position players, are they actually hitting a ball, hitting a ball? And, and you realize they've done it tens to hundreds of thousands of times. Um, and they're right. No ball arrives exactly the same as another. Each swing, each shot, each kick, each is fundamentally different. So... One of the keys we're going to learn and apply it to our vision therapy is variability begets adaptability. What we want are people who are adaptable. Regardless of the situation or the condition, they can meet that. And one of the things we need to do is to be very variable in what it is we do. So with variability comes adaptability. Being able to produce slightly different variable patterns allows us to adapt to changes in our environment, both internal and external. Um, internal. I, I'll give you an example. I'm a professional musician. Each time I pick up the horn that day, warming up is, it's really about what do I need to do today to produce the nicest sound on that particular note? Because my body is different. Um, I play bass trombone, so it's, it's a lot of air, uh, lips on a mouthpiece. Are my lips as su supple? Are they, um, what's the strength in them? How is my control of the muscles? What do I have to do to get a nice, clean airflow? And warming up those internal variables, uh, I always think is warming up, is introducing me today to the machinery that I have to use in order to produce the sounds that I am producing. It's the same thing for an athlete as they warm up, uh, they do their stretching, they figure out how is my body taking the commands I'm giving it today. So I just want you to understand what he means by internal. And then external, there's all these other things that are going on. If the problems of movement are always changing, even for one of the greatest tennis players in history, then we need to have multiple solutions, multiple ways to approach doing different things. Um, you think about it as using a ret retinoscope or an ophthalmoscope in different kinds of situations. And um, I, I take residents to, uh, we go to four different rehab hospitals, and um, you can't always get in the optimal position 
um, uh, patients just not going to let you. Um, can you still use the tools of your trade in situations that are non-optimal um, and still gain your clinical insights? So this adaptability through having multiple variable solutions to achieve the same goal is a fundamental feature found throughout nature and it had a term. I didn't know it until I read his book, biological degeneracy. Okay, biological degeneracy. Degeneracy occurs in a system when components that are structurally dissimilar can perform similar functions. Then they become interchangeable. Um, hard to come up with a direct example right away, but uh, the... Um, I remember when uh, the famous brain scientist Carl Pribram was talking about, well, where do you think in the brain how to write the letter A exists? And can you only do it with your right hand? Well, you can do it with the left hand, you can do it with your foot, you can draw an A in the, in the sand, uh, you could probably, if you put a marker in your mouth, you could probably draw an A. Um, and it turns out, um, his concept was the holographic mind, that actually the motor patterns of how to, how to make an A are actually stored everywhere. So similar functions with different parts, but they're interchangeable because it's the outcome you want. Okay? So if... You, if you do something the same way over and over and over again, exactly the same, you're, you're open to um, wear and tear and abuse and injury. If you do things in a variable way, that's beneficial. It's a design feature and allows us to adapt, keep achieving our goals, but it seems to prevent us from getting hurt. This breakdown will occur when there's not enough variability in movement to allow for adaptation. So change up what we're doing and that allows for um, us to stay safe. So traditional sports training. Um, and I, I'm not gonna spend a whole bunch of time with this. I'll get you the, um, uh, this um, handout and you can work through it. But if you notice, there's things here where he's, you've got the DynaVision, the NeuroTracker, the Synaptic Station, Visual Edge Trainer. These are all things in, um, that are out there, uh, fit lights, uh, dribbling cones, these kinds of things. Um, and you're essentially going to see that a lot of people that say, well, I want to get into sports vision. Well, you need to buy this and this and this and this. And it's like, uh... We don't need a lot of these gadgets, okay? So hopefully I'm starting out basically saying, if you thought to get into sports vision, you have to spend a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. The answer is no, okay? You could spend money. Having some gadgets is nice. It makes it more fun, but it's not owning gadgets that makes you a sports vision person, okay? So I hope some of you are relieved. Yes, relief? Ah, okay, let's move on. So self-organization is the key. Order and structure arises from the interactions between lower level components of the system, which results in this perception-action coupling. Our actions are directly controlled by what we perceive. I, I love it. Actions are directly controlled by what we perceive. So I'm, I'm down with the Orioles just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, one of my first interactions with the new batting coach for the Major League team, he said, um, oh, I'm so glad to meet you. I know how you're going to be able to help us. What I want is I want our players to make better decisions. And I looked at him, and I knew I didn't know him well enough, but... I figured, okay, I'm going to do this one. And, and I knew he might take it as an exact punch in the face, okay? But here's what I said. I said, no, you don't. And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, 
You don't want them making decisions at all. What you want are actions that are controlled by what they perceive, but you don't want a decision because if they're consciously thinking about what's going on, the action is over before they ever have come to a decision. You want them based on recognizing patterns from prior experience to simply be in the moment and act according to the what the environment and that could be a moving ball within a context is giving them the chance to do so as soon as I said it he said you're exactly right I don't want them making better decisions I want them performing better and based on perceiving more so uh, we move past that very quickly so Self-organizing systems are much more robust and resistant to errors made in any one part of the system. Uh, I have, and I'll show you um, on the Reinventing Optometry site, I have a paper, um, Wet Mind uh, was a book I probably read in the 90s uh, and did a report on it. It's, uh, it's about a cognitive neuroscience, uh, and it was my first introduction to neural networks and really how the human uh, neurological system works. And there was a lot of talk about self-organizing systems. And the basic idea is if you have a neural network system, which we have in the retina, which we have in our brain, we have our brain has uh, a series of three layer networks, but the brain is actually six layers. You have two three layer networks that are intertwined. Um, and I don't want to get into the whole thing, but it, it turns out if you have one of these self-organizing systems, you can actually have up to between 70 and 80% cell death, and the system will still give you the right answer. It just slows down. So this is what we see in stroke. This is what we see in concussion uh, and these types of things. Um, so uh, the, brain or self, uh, the brain itself is a self-organizing system. And if we have multiple ways to approach doing the different things we do, we become more resistant to um, uh, errors and to damage in the system itself. So Carl Newell talked about this constraints model of coordination. So first, a constraint is something that eliminates certain possibilities or options for action. Please, the whole time I'm reading this and we're talking about this in the context of sport, think, think. He's talking about vision therapy too. Everything here relates to every procedure and activity that we can do in vision therapy. So a constraint is something that eliminates certain possibilities or options for actions. Um, when we use a patch in an activity, we're eliminating all binocular input, we're eliminating uh, uh, the chance to see diplopia, we're eliminating, it's a constraint, okay? We have a person seated, now they can't translate through space and move, that's a constraint. Constraints serve to exclude some actions, they reduce the degrees of freedom. So there's three types of constraints in the individual, their height, weight, strength, speed, flexibility, environment, uh, we're not changing gravity, but wind, temperature, light levels, slipperiness of the surface. Um, um, my dad was a bowler, and uh, uh, he said, oh yes, they." I love the phrase, they dressed the lanes differently when there was competition. It means they put different kind of wax on it. So you throw your, your normal ball and it, it would like just skid instead of rolling and moving. Uh, and the top pros, um, uh, they're, they're throwing those balls on lanes that you or I could never make the ball do the things they do. Um, and most people don't realize that kind of thing, that they change the slipperiness of the surface uh, and that type of thing. So. Uh, and then tasks. There's factors highly specific to the skill being performed, and that's what we're going to be talking about here. So, what about practical uses of constraints? So first we have freezing degrees of freedom. 
What Bernstein, if you go all the way back, that's the fellow with the hammer, proposed when we first learn a new movement skill, we constrain, that should be constrained, not constraint, we constrain ourselves naturally through a process he calls freezing degrees of freedom. So we constrain to amplify errors and to take away ineffective movement. So uh, the example he gives here is pitching on sand. So a baseball pitcher going through the motions, taking the stride and leaning the foot down. If you have a hard surface, um, you may hit the same way every time and not get the sense of, of, of what you're actually doing. But if they make them pitch on sand, um, it amplifies some of the errors so that they can figure out how do I make the foot go properly. Uh, and then they can apply that to normal pitching. So uh, I put here in parentheses, uh, those of you that we've talked about yoked prisms before, the Kraskin approach to prescribing your prisms, uh, the reference for that, if you're, if you have, if this is coming from left field for you, uh, the funny baseball phrase, left field, um, is Lens Power in Action uh, as a book, um, but the use of yoke prisms. Kraskin's method was to amplify an error so that the person would then naturally do what they need to to fix the mistake and they would come away with a new skill or ability. So in the beginning we constrain things. I remember when trying to teach my daughter first how to catch and it was like she wanted to learn uh, you know baseball, uh, softball, uh, that kind of thing and it's like if I just throw this thing at her and she's never done this <laughs> we're gonna get hit in the head, we're gonna get hit in the body, it's gonna hurt and we're finished. So how do I work this? Um, and I started very simply with Anna. That's uh, my daughter who wanted to learn. Anna, hold your glove. There's a glove hand and a throwing hand. Just hold it like that. We're going to practice up-downers, right? I toss a nice softball, go up and down. And the challenge was I was trying to just hit her glove, right? So it just went in, okay? So she got some success. It wouldn't hurt, okay? And... We got pretty good at up-downers where I was first doing this, right? Very constrained. All you have to do is hold the thing there. And then I intentionally started to move it around. So she had to make a movement with it. And then I made it so that she'd have to take a step or lean and then come in or come out. And eventually we got pretty good that I could do up-downers that were higher. Eventually up-downers where we caught over our head, but then there was still the, the, um, the transition to, I'm going to actually throw it at her and she's got to catch it this way. And we called those zingers. Okay. Anna, here comes a zinger. And it was, don't hold this near your face, hold it out over here. And the challenge for me was to hit her glove. Okay. Same thing again. And to get the timing for her of as the ball's coming, when to close it. By the way, we know that for almost any speed ball, the, the optimal closing time, there's only a 50 millisecond time. If you come too early, the ball bounces off. If you go too late, it bounces off and you don't get it. It's within 50 milliseconds to close on that ball when it gets there. And it doesn't matter how fast the ball is going. It's the same 50 milliseconds. Um, so we transition to zingers. Um, do you begin to understand how I constrain things in that sequence? Feedback, please. Nod your head. Okay, I got one thumb. There we go. Wonderful smile. Is that push pita? Is that how you say it? Okay, very nice. So practical uses. We, why do we do this constraint? We do it to create variability and essential noise. I think sometimes we always think of noise as something that's bad and something we have to get rid of. Um, but constraint is important. We want to be adaptable and flexible so that we can use different movement solutions to achieve our goal in the face of ever-changing conditions. Okay, And we think about that. Um, 
uh, we're working accommodative rock and this kind of thing. People don't only do it with that kind of target, with that kind of lens, with that. They have to do it under different life situations. Bernstein said, dexterity is the ability to find a motor solution for any external situation. That is, to adequately solve any emerging motor problem. If the primary purpose of the visual process is to direct movements, then in this instance what we're talking about is not just the dexterity of the hands and the arms and the body, it's actually the visual system that's directing things. Moving skillfully involves coming up with new solutions to new problems not just repeating the same old solution. And I, I hope you're hearing what Nadal is talking about here. No ball that comes to him is ever exactly the same. Speed, velocity, rotation, movement, where it bounced, uh, the relative position of the player on the other side. Nothing is exactly the same. So how do we learn to solve problems? We do it by practicing a lot of different ones. In other words, by having variability in our practice situations. So, he did a thing with virtual reality training um, uh, in batting. So, <laughs> I think you understand they had a virtual reality set up and they could vary things. They would vary speed, how fast it went, the pitch type, straight, curveball, etc., and location. And in, in the VR stuff, they could see if the person made the swing was that, did they make contact, et cetera. And they'd start with 85 mile an hour pitches, two in a row. If you hit both of them, right, then they would change the speed, faster, slower. And if the main thing they were working on was speed, um, the more consistent you could hit it, the more they would change the speeds. Um, in VR, you can control these things a lot more than you can with a real pitcher. Okay, uh, and then he could do pitch variation. Let's say we're playing with pitch type. You hit two fastballs in a row, then would come a curveball. If you hit the curveball, then and they would change and change and change. Um, the curveball at first would only move by one foot, then two feet, then a full meter in terms of how far it would move. And what they found was batters that had the more variability in their practice actually did better when they took the VR off and went into real play with real uh, pitchers. Um, I think that was fantastic. So he now talks about embodied perception. The perception of the world is changing depending on our ability to act on it. <laughs> Meaning, if we recognize the changes, we recognize things that are out there, we can see and we can act to it. I, I, I saw a concussed um, uh, softball player from one of the local colleges um, uh, yesterday afternoon, and I had two second-year optometry school students watching over my shoulder. And I can do some very simple eye movements, and I see this and that, and, and I have to do it multiple times, point it out, have them see it, maybe even make a video of it, slow it down, and then help them see what I just saw so that they could look for it the next time. Um, and I think this is um, uh, part of what we're looking at, is the experience that we have allows us to recognize things out in the environment um, but you have to have experience with it. It needs to be pointed out to you. You need to, to uh, work through that. So when an athlete is more capable, think of when an optometrist is more capable, and performing well, objects like a baseball, tennis ball, or basketball hoop look bigger. When they're struggling, they look smaller. So to me, I just did this eye movement, and I saw this woman's eyes instead of going whoosh. They went ah. And I could see all these little tiny jagged movements when I'm just trying to go whoosh. And that said to me, yep, she has not recovered from her um, taking a foul ball to the head, um, even though it happened several months ago. And I could demonstrate it to the students. Better yet, her coach 
and the head athletic trainer were with me, I could demonstrate it to them. Uh, and they could see what I was seeing. And, I, and that becomes uh, critical in this. So this embodied perception approach to perception argues that what we perceive is not a true representation of what is out there, but it reflects our ability to act on objects in our environment. So as we become better diagnosticians, there are more things our patients do that we can recognize that give us insight into what's happening in their own visual process. Okay? Now, now I, I hope you begin to get why I thought, oh my gosh, this guy's, this guy's approach to sports is so in alignment with what we do uh, in the vision field. So Gibson, um, when I went to optometry school, my perception textbook was by Gibson and Gibson. They were a husband and wife. Uh, and uh, I see Liette uh, nodding her head, yes. Uh, it's the foundation of so much of what we do. Uh, and he talked about affordances. Now, I've seen this come up uh, in many different ways. What's an affordance? You're coming up to a door. You see there's a flat panel. You know you should push on that. Uh, that's an affordance. You see a grab hold. Uh, you know you're probably supposed to pull that door, not push that door. Okay? So um, another affordance in design, a door. If they show the hinge, you can see the hinge on your side, you know you pull it this way. Uh, so those are things that, that tell you about function. So in our environment, surfaces afford, meaning they provide or supply, opportunities for actions. Flat surfaces provide opportunities to rest. Surfaces with gaps, opportunities to pass through. Hanging surfaces uh, allow us to seek shelter and so on. Uh, quick aside, my work with the Norwegian biathlon team, I was brought in to help with the shooting. And we did vision therapy, worked with a number of the players um, and uh, the skiers. And I thought it was very interesting. One of them, she took me aside. She said, Doc, don't stop selling yourself short. Your therapy helped me recognize the curvature of the snow better so that when I was skiing, I could attack the snow completely through the course rather than simply in certain parts making sure I stayed in the track and, and um, just uh, keeping up with others. Now I felt I could attack the whole way through. Vince, I don't know if you do cross-country skiing. Are you a cross-country skier? A little bit. But you have a sense of what I mean of seeing the contour of the snow. Probably not so much of the Israelis, but that's okay. <laughs> um, you can imagine snow, right? Or uh, uh, go to Dubai in one of those indoor... Um, sorry, I'm kidding. Okay. Um, so perceiving affordances is to carve the world up into meaningful units of action rather than using meaningless units of physics. Um, knowing the equation doesn't really help you. So performers see pass-through ability in a gap, tackle ability of an opponent, hit ability of a pitch. Yes, I'm going to turn on that. So it's these perception of opportunities for action, not just the physical properties. Um, and, and, and therein lies the difference between some of these therapies that are really not directly related to what it is we do. So why is our perception embodied? Our perceptual system is not designed to gather general purpose information about the world or to try to accurately reconstruct it inside our heads. Its purpose is to keep us in contact with action-relevant properties of the specific environment we are acting in. Action-relevant. I'm a basketball player and I'm bringing the ball down. I don't really care about a lot of things. What I care about is spaces and gaps between my players and opponent players. 
And any gap that gets larger than a certain amount becomes a place I want to send the ball to because my player is open, and if I get the ball to them in time, uh, before that gap closes, they will have an open shot to try to score for my team. So um, an affordance there is a gap. Um, uh, and, and looking for that, but seeing the opportunities is the critical thing. So embodied perception supports action selection. Um, and again, not thinking about it, the recognition, there's the opportunity, take advantage of it. So we also want our players to find new movement solutions. A movement solution is not created from nothing. It's built on top of the perceptual motor landscape that the athlete brings to the first day of practice. So every athlete, every musician, every patient, right, has both their intrinsic dynamics, the way they move, but most likely some attractors have been created through early experience. They have a way they whistle. They have a way they throw a ball. They have a way they rotate their body when they do something. And many of these things are very distinctive to that person, although if you don't know the sport, you watch them and they all look like they're the same. Okay? And, and I think that's, you know, if you're new to sports and you're new to a sport, when you watch people do that sport, it just looks like a mess. Everybody looks like they're doing the same thing. But when you know a sport, okay, I can mimic the pitching motions of certain pitchers and the batting motions of certain batters. And I'm sure Vince can uh, do the slap shot of certain um, uh, uh, ice hockey players. Right, Vince? No, you're not a hockey guy either. Okay, that's fine. That, don't worry about it. But uh, just own it, man. You know, come on, you're Canadian. You got to own that. All right. So, um, but we, we begin to get that nuance. And it's the same thing with a retinoscope. The first time it's like, I don't know, the eye lit up, you know? And, and then it's like, oh, I see it moving. And then it's like, oh, but did you see? No. Oh, oh, now I can. And now you can't turn that stuff off. Every time you put a retinoscope and line it up in an eye, it's like, wow, look at this stuff that's there, okay? So it's the same kind of thing with looking at these movements. All right. Every single athlete you coach is different. <laughs> Every single patient we see is different. Every single one. Coaching is not building a house from the ground up. I, I love this sense. It's a renovation and expansion. Success requires designing practice that builds on each performer's foundation. That's why I love this idea that we're doing vision therapy. Who are you? What are the skills? What do you bring to this? Um, and each day we see the same person, they're different. So we've got to design our therapy activities to match right where that person is. The attractor landscape we create is shaped by the constraints we face when practicing a skill. So now there's some new terms. Some of you have had courses with me before. Uh, know that I talk about um, uh, development. I talk about high-level learning. This term he brought in, bifurcation. Um, it means splitting into two different things. Um, the way he described it, I went, oh, he's talking about Piagetian development or the aha phenomenon. He said, this type of learning in which we switch to using a completely different coordination pattern that we never did before by creating a new attractor is called bifurcation. You're doing something the same way, the same way, the same way, the same way, and all of a sudden it's like, ooh, what if I, and boom, there's something different and new that comes out, and you try it, and it's like, I'm never going back to that one, okay? And this new thing emerges. So it reflects the fact that the performers taking their perceptual motor landscape, they break it into new parts and regions of stability and instability. Doing this is usually accompanied with a large amount of variability as the person explores different ways. If we see this in the therapy room, don't correct something. Let them go. 
okay? And I think sometimes one of the hardest parts in our vision therapy is as someone is about to come to this aha, is we get in and we keep playing with it. And it's like, no, back away. Let them stay in it. Now, shift. We had bifurcation. Now he's talking shift. I liken this to the Piaget high-level learning. He said, instead of doing wild exploration like the first group, their learning now is a gradual shift towards the desired pattern. This type of learning is referred to as a shift. It reflects on the fact that we are not completely restructuring our perceptual motor landscape but, and making new attractors, but instead we're just shifting and reorganizing ones we already have. And the terms here of Piaget, accommodation and assimilation. Now here I'm not using accommodation in an optometric sense, very much in a Piagetian sense. Incorporating some of the new, assimilating, and then making change of how I use things uh, in order to get things done in life. So, some keys to providing effective vision therapy. We need to be a designer. We need to be a guide. Um, so an effective coach, an effective vision therapist, should attempt to design practice environments that foster exploration and promote self-organization rather than prescribing a solution to an athlete. Meaning, we don't tell our patients what to do. We arrange conditions, allow them to explore, and they will self-organize a new way to approach things. Be informed and knowledgeable about the search process. They should also be observing practice. We should be observing practice to see if the athletes are not taking the opportunities for actions. Okay. Um, and I think that's part of the role of us in the therapy room when we're therapists. All right, now he talks about constraint-led approach. And again, this book and listening to him, we're introducing these ideas that they have articulated and, formula and, and put down. Um, we've been doing it in effective vision therapy, but never really made it explicit um, a lot of these things were assumed. One, we need to be manipulating uh, a constraint in practice in order to, we want to destabilize the existing movement solution or attractor. But whatever the person is doing isn't working, and we've got to move them away from that. So a constraint may make it impossible for them to continue doing the thing that didn't work or wasn't working. We then want to encourage exploration and self-organization. We want to amplify information and invite affordances. Invite affordances. Help shift their attention to something that might help them make better decisions. Um, that type of thing. Provide transition feedback about the effectiveness of the search. Uh, amplify information. Let me give you a, a quick one. Basketball, learning on defense. Somebody told the player, you need to watch their eyes. Watch their eyes. That's going to tell you what's going on. And, and they're just locked in on their eyes, and they keep getting faked out, moved around, uh, ball through their legs, this kind of thing. And it's like, okay, let's shift that. Don't look at their eyes. Try looking at different parts of their body. And maybe they will discover that looking at the torso actually is better when defending a player in basketball, okay? Um, rather than me saying, well, where you should be looking is, because maybe they won't figure that out, okay? I, I hope you understand what I mean. Don't give them the answer, but, but by restricting something, don't look at their eyes. Um, explore, look at different parts of the body while you're defending, and then set up practice drills. Um, they may figure out, wow, I'm not letting them pass me more if I watch their torso. Bingo. Okay. Oh, and if I look soft, not with an intensity like I was when I was looking at their eyes, I'm even a better defender. Bingo. Okay. <laughs> uh, Bingo, if you don't know, I use meaning you've scored. It's good, okay? So CLA, constraint-led approach, is trying to achieve, achieve adding structured variability to our practice. 
We want to allow the performer to explore and try different things, but we're pushing them to certain areas within the perceptual motor landscape that we've identified as being key for an effective movement solution. So a key is um, uh, where should you be looking when you're defending. Yesterday, uh, when I had the um, uh, concussed softball player, now her coach was there, uh, turns out she said, oh yeah, I played for the Italian national team and, and da, da 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 So it's like, okay, you know the game. Because I know baseball. I know where we have our baseball players look just before, uh, look on the pitcher before the pitch comes in and where I want them to look at the moment of release. And But softball is, is an under kind of thing, uh, underhand pitch. And I was like, well, where do you have them look? And uh, we went through the whole thing and we talked about some of these differences. Uh, and it was, it was very interesting, um, uh, some of the differences between where, where they're taught in softball versus in baseball, um, where to look and what they're doing. Okay, So um, what do you have to do to find this effective movement solution? Whether it's keeping the kinetic chain intact when pitching or using a low to high stroke trajectory in tennis. Instead of tennis just coming straight across, it's coming up through the ball to get appropriate spins and this type of thing. So um, when you either get the book or you go to that website, uh, and again, I'll get this to Judy uh, later, um, uh, you'll be able to go through this in more detail. I don't want to spend too much time with the graphic image. Um, so differential learning, I'm just looking at our time. We're supposed to stop, Judy, soon? Yes, we have 10 more minutes. OK, and you want five or so at the end. So I think I'll do, I think I'll do one or two more slides. And then from this point on, I will record for everybody uh, the end. I didn't know how, how long this take. I rushed it when I was uh, doing it in January, but I like this version much better. Um, of course I do, because uh, I'm adding all this other fun stuff. We're only halfway through this, so I will record probably this weekend the rest of this. And once I get my access to Moodle, I'll put this up for you as well, so you can finish this, uh, this um, um, uh, presentation. So. Differential learning. Differential learning has goals, again, of destabilizing the performer's existing movement solutions. Why would we want to do that? Well, we want to promote exploration of the perceptual motor landscape, self-organization, and to create variability in movement execution. How do we do that? We add random variability to the practice environment, we perturb. I don't know if you know that as an English word. We, we mess with things. We, we change things up. Um, we then allow the performer to gain information about the solution space that they could use in future performances. And I think the example of the person who was told, look at the eyes, look at the head, um, and um, experienced and high-level people in the sport of basketball know that's not what you want to have the person do. I'll give you another example out of baseball. We tell young kids, keep your eye on the ball. Follow the ball all the way in. Um, that's good for maybe the first year or first two years of uh, when you're 9, 10 years old, learning how to follow in and hit something. But baseball and softball, the good players, they do not do that. They only follow the ball for maybe the first two meters of travel, and then they jump their eyes to where the ball, they predict it will be, watch it come in. And so when does, it, when does a child begin to learn, uh, stop listening to the dads in the stands and the moms in the stands yelling, keep your eye on the ball, keep your eye on the ball, kid, um, to learn that you actually shouldn't do that. I, I hope you get that, that there's different ways to do things. And if a person gets stuck in a, in a less developmentally mature, maybe that's the better way to say it, they get stuck in that way of doing it, 
that they will never let go and really become a master of his or her skill ability in this thing. Okay, so you want to create then also the optimal level of noise for the person so that they acquire those skills. So um, here's a, um, uh, again, a website, hisperceptionaction.com. Uh, that's where a lot of this will be. Uh, wonderful, wonderful demonstrations. Uh, I'm going to stop the share. Stop share. Okay, and come back to you guys here. And I think I will turn it over to Judy. I was watching. No questions. I know I was going and rolling and having fun. I hope you enjoyed uh, this first uh, portion. Got a chance to get a sense of how I'm interweaving my understanding of human performance, what we do as um, optometrists and vision therapists, um, the, the wonderful intermeshing of sport to me is the visual system being displayed in all the, the wonders of what it can do uh, as we work through various sports. So I'm going to turn this back over to Judy I'm going to jump off because I get a nice 10-hour day now in uh, the clinic uh, and uh, at Southern College of Optometry. I'll be in VT all day. And I've got new third years coming in. Oh, boy. So I, I get to uh, orient them around 1030 this morning. Um, lovely to see all your faces, to be with you. Um, uh, you will get my email address, questions from this questions from any of the things you're looking at, please uh, send them to me. And I look forward May 17, you said, right? Judy, 17 May. May 17th, yes. Yes, is our next uh, live session. So thank you, Paul. Everybody stay on for a couple of minutes. Judy will go through the website with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. You're welcome.